in the media performance competition, that's the uh, EAT, judging criteria, the employment tribunals, factual test, would have to enter into a fray of the rights and wrongs of the collective bargaining. Whose right to claim 2% or inflation or above inflation, uh, whose right is on that? Somewhere that the, the, the law has kept tribunals entirely clear of the, judging the rights and wrongs of industrial action, even to the extent uh, within the uh, Wages Claims, Wages Act, taking that out of the jurisdiction of the tribunal. If it's a wages claim, reduction of wages which is relating to industrial action or strike. This would be the first time in which the employment tribunal was asked to look into the negotiating room and judge the quality of the beer and sandwiches. <coughs> Under my uh, interpretation, future result interpretation, all the employment tribunal has to do is look at the offer, either the express offer or the covert implicit offer, does it, is it an offer to pull down collective bargaining, and is that the employer's intention, looking at all the evidence, that's what the employer has purpose. Uh, the other consequences uh, of the immediate result interpretation is that uh, it will encourage uh, courts, uh, unions to be ambitious in the demands that they make, uh, knowing that an employment tribunal going to be the arbiter of the reasonableness, of rationality, the good business sense of the employer's position. Uh, and so it makes sense to start by asking for more. So that's the factual inquiry that would be the consequence, that is the consequence of the employment appeal tribunal's approach. Uh, finally, turning to Mr. Crittenden's points that I haven't addressed expressly so far <coughs> in his skeleton. And a particular point that he makes at page 101 in the core bundle. The one following. Uh, at the bottom of page 101 is he says that the heading to 145D, inducement to taking effective bargaining, uh, is. Could you just give me, sorry to interrupt, could you just give me the internal um, paragraph? Sorry, 101, 34, 1. Thank you. Page. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President says that the heading to the title, uh, <coughs> inducement relating to effective bargaining, is in his favour. I say that that uses inducements is in my favour, but that uses relating to in his favour. We all know that headings to statutory sections are of limited uh, importance in construction exercises. But I say... I'm set, I am behind you. Which, which paragraph? 34, what? Bottom of page 101. Oh, yes, I see. He says it's an important clue. I say the important clue is inducements. He says it's relating to... That on. I, we both accept that it's a, it's a heading to the heading of the So I hark back to the enacting history and the fact that the, the inducements to forego and the uh, discussion that it must be an inducement there really because otherwise the offer is not going to be accepted to forego collective bargaining if what's really being keyed into there. Uh, the Page 102, where any of those terms will not be detected by effective bargaining, uh, we of course have to have will no longer, will not or will no longer. Uh, on Mr. Britain's construction, he rightly leaves out the word will no longer, because on his construction, on the 80th construction, will no longer are entirely superfluous. No need for because on the immediate construction, whether you're looking at the unrecognised union hmm. or the recognised union, we're only looking at what is the, the circumstances that meet the art of acceptance and will not, will do for both those circumstances. The fact that the words and will or will no longer in there are a major clue to the fact that this is the future result interpretation the statute has in mind. 
otherwise they are entirely superfluous. Paragraph 34.6 at page 103. I accept that the prohibited result has to be judged by reference to when the offer was made. You have my permission already that you've got the word would. So you're actually you're judging it for the time the offer was made, but what would happen if it's accepted? And then you get on to the prohibited result, which has the will not or no longer. Which Mr. Britton accepts to a certain extent in paragraph 34, 7 below, saying that conditional terms, future conditional terms, would have a prohibited result. A shorthand, my shorthand is criticised in his paragraph 38 on page 104. He says, My case is contingent on concepts of immediate results and future results, which do not feature in the legislation, overcomplicate provision, and calls for straightforward and special analysis. <coughs> As I hopefully indicated at the beginning, those are just my shorthand, so that during these submissions, I can tell you which of the interpretations I'm referring to. They don't complicate the section at all. It either means one thing or it means another thing. And those are just my headings. Over the page at 105, Paragraph 38.3, Mr. Brittenden addresses the first future tense, explains that for use of wood, but he doesn't explain the second. In his paragraph 39 at the bottom, he says, let's take an example. Knight is recognised to collectively bargain over annual pay awards and various other terms and conditions. If an informed worker was asked at the moment that each of the two offers were made, if you accept this offer, will your way to pay for 2016 be determined by collective agreement negotiated with by or behalf of the union? The answer is no. You'll notice there that uh, we have the first future tense, if you accept this offer, will, but then we don't have the second one, because he, he goes into the present tense. Your way to pay be determined, or indeed even the past tense. The question is not, if you accept this offer, will your way to, way to pay? The question is, if you accept this offer, will it have the previous result, and the previous result has the future tense there? Skipping on to page 107, uh, he says that even on my case, uh, Costal will be liable under section 145b because the direct officers were permanent in nature. Well, uh, of course, I. My case is a construction case, the tribunal and the EAT got the construction of the prohibited result wrong. But, but look, he says, uh, look at page. 107.43.1, the appellant can escape from the fact that the individual terms and conditions concerning the 2015 collective bonus could not be visited, be, be, revisited in any future round of collective bargaining. Well, that's the fact of just an unambitious union. Of course it could be revisited. And of course, if a union wants to, as they often will, they'll say, we want a payment backdated about the 2015 Christmas bonus. But there's nothing that takes the 2015 Christmas bonus off the table. Everything is on the table, all terms and conditions, and it is, I don't need to push the point, it is very common for unions years down the line to go back to something that was or wasn't imposed or agreed earlier on and say, I want to go back to that. Why shouldn't they? In fact, of course they should. And this, uh, in this circumstance, uh, they agreed uh, all the, the matters, including uh, the Christmas bonus that had been applied. And they didn't, I don't think, uh, seek for a backdated Christmas bonus for those people who had lost out. But that was their uh, negotiating uh, choice to make. Uh, 
skipping on to page 112. It said that the appeal is academic. My understanding of this, this point is that because the tribunal made a finding of fact on main, sole or main purpose, the appeal is academic. I say it's not academic because section 145D requires two conditions. First of all, it requires the offer to achieve the result. I say it didn't, because I say my, my uh, construction is correct. And second, it then requires the employer to have in its purpose the result. And I said that the error flows through to, to that one. So for those reasons, I say this is certainly not academic. If the tribunal got the construction prohibited result wrong, they got it wrong both for the first part of the question and for the second part of the question. So any finds the fact that they made on the second part of the question are, are, are first of all subject to getting the right on the first part of the question and uh, secondly uh, the tribunal had in its mind the wrong purpose when it was trying to find the fact as to what the employer's purpose was. The employer said its purpose was just I direct you to what the employer said at the time. I'm just trying to fix the terms for now, but no intention to undermine collective bargaining in the future. Um, Mr. Whitson, there at the end of the skeleton, paragraph 59 on page 14, addresses the respective veto. says it's OCHO's prohibitor <coughs> from part of the tribunal's fight. The way I put it forward is that Parliament would have intended section 145B to have a workable and an industrially workable meaning. Uh, Parliament couldn't have intended and didn't intend section 145B to affect a sea change in industrial relations. Can I just ask you about some of the industrial practical implications. Uh, correct me if I've misunderstood the situation, but what we're talking about is frequently, as in this case, an annual round. And, and that's because, other things being equal, people tend to expect an annual pay rise. They don't, they don't always get it. Sometimes there's been pay decreases in recent years. But, yeah, and there's no entitlement to a pay rise, no contractual or other entitlement. And so the way in which, as I understand it, our, in our law analyzes what's really going on as a matter of law is that the employer says to the employees, if you want this pay rise, then there's a number of other terms and conditions in your contract I would like to vary. And it's only by agreeing the package that the employees then get their pay rights. Sometimes, most commonly, there will just be a pay increase in the negotiation and nothing else. No, I understand that. But, but, but if the employer is trying to achieve, if the reason why there's, let's say, an impasse with the union is because that they're trying to achieve some other changes. And that, that they, they can't do that. It would be a breach of contract if they just imposed it. So one option is, they, all right, you don't like these changes, you don't get your pay rise. Is that right? Yeah. So that's, that's, one, that's one thing that employer could do in practice. That doesn't mean the union has a veto to insist on imposing its terms, does it? Well, it does to this extent, because if you have 700, let's look at the cost out, you have 700 employees, mm. and you have uh, a union which is holding out because it doesn't want to consolidate to break, <coughs> to make a Unit break and it's holding out on everything else for that, for that reason because mm. its members would prefer to have two 15 minute breaks. You then have a situation where the employer wants or needs to uh, look after the interests of all its employees, and the employer, for good business reasons, will not want its productivity to fall by not giving a, a pay increase at all. The employer needs to, to give a pay increase so that all of the employees are motivated and rewarded and so forth. And the, the veto effectively is, I put, if I, if I give this regardless, I have 
a section 145D liability. I give it just to, to non-members. I potentially have a section 146 discrimination against union members liability. Uh, and if I don't do anything, if I just sit on my hands and let the, leave the contract as it is, then everybody's unhappy. I'm unhappy because I've got the money to pay an incentive to my employees. All my employees are unhappy because they're getting nothing. And who? And the employer is going to be. Oh, but if like, they get nothing, they have no remedy. I mean, they, they can't go to a tribunal and ask for an award. Uh, it may lead to industrial discontent. It may lead to all sorts of things. But in, in law, if the employer says, right, no change to anything at all, nobody has any remedy. Absolutely right. And what about the scenario which the Employment Tribunal envisaged? And it referred to its own experience of industrial practice. And I bear in mind that they had the lay members yeah. in the tribunal. Uh, I think this morning you said that their analysis was wrong as a matter of law, at least for my benefit. Could you just elaborate on why that, that was yeah. wrong? Why couldn't the employer terminate the individual contract of employment and then re-employ the person at, on the new terms and conditions? Because when the so a, a, a hire when you fire, which is the sometimes referred to by Mr. Hendy QC as the ultimate weapon of the uh, industrial relations, uh, which the employer has uh, in its army, is to say to the worker, I am going to give you notice of dismissal from your present contract because here is your new, the offer of new contract terms. You can take it or you can be re employed uh, without without break, seamlessly, or you can reject it, in which case you're out. And then if they can bring a claim for unfair dismissal, but potentially the employer has a some other substantial reason for dismissal, which has to be within the bounds of range of reasonable responses. But of course, if I, I'm you all my lord, if you're one of those employees and I said to you, here's your notice, three months notice of employment or one month's notice, here's the new contract that you can either decide to accept or carry on or not. I'm offering you a contract. I'm offering new terms and conditions. I'm making an offer which, if accepted, the immediate consequence of that is that our terms between us will be determined by a direct agreement between you and me, and not by collective agreements negotiated by on behalf of the union. So the employment tribunal had in mind that the fire and hire offer was somehow outside of Section 145B. Mm. But unless the employer employer waited until you were no longer a worker, so you left and went away and that business stopped and then offered new contracts, you would always be a worker with a right 1456B right not to have an offer made you. So the hire and fire in which the uh, employer gives an offer with the dismissal and notice or within the notice period in order to have seamless work would not work unless the so for those reasons, I say it's the future result of interpretation that must be intended by Parliament and that the Tribunal and the EAT are in error in giving it the immediate result of interpretation. Yes, I um, can, can I just ask, are you going to show us the document at tab three of the bundle of authorities, which is the order of 2000. Uh, I, I had, as I said, in my lunchtime, I had, I crossed that off as being a, um, uh, no longer time to, to deal with. We dealt with it briefly in our skeleton. Yes, you did. It's a very short uh, point, and it's just this at tab three, over the page, in the preamble. So after, in 2000, after the Bargain, the, the trade union recognition uh, method of bargaining order after uh, compulsory uh, recognition it is uh, processes in place, can be imposed by the CAC. We see that uh, in uh, that. And, and, and those were in the 1999, were they? When, when, when was the CAC? Right. I think 1999. Look at my green book. Uh, 
it's, 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 and the insertion into the 1902 yeah. Act goes, mm. most of them are. The, fo the footnotes of the 2000 um, order suggests. Yes, yeah, the Employment Relations Act 1999. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Carry on. My point is a short, short one, which you see in the sideline <coughs> side paragraph. The uh, regulation, the order, specifically envisages the process whereby the employer can make a direct offer. Uh, for example, the fact that the CSC has imposed a method does not affect the rights of individual workers under the statute or their contract employment. For instance, for example, it does not prevent or limit the rights of individual workers to discuss and they negotiate or agree with their employer in terms of the contract of employment, which differ from the terms of any collective agreement into which the employer and union may enter the result of collective bargaining conducted by this method. That hasn't been changed or altered as a result of Wilson Palmer or result of the amendments of section 4.5b. That's still the position as regards compulsory uh, collective bargaining. But the order itself permits a employer to agree terms which differ from any collective agreement under collective bargaining. So effectively another part of the law permits this and therefore And I think you, you go slightly further, I think, that this is not just another part of the law, it is actually part of the law on recognition of trade unions. Exactly. On exactly. The two things would be inconsistent and one would have expected the this order would have to be except in certain parts of the Very much, Mr. Britton. Lord Mayor, yes. Um, this appeal obviously concerns the, the reach of, of Section 1145 of the 1992 Act. There's two, from our uh, perspective, two um, key questions. What does the prohibited result actually mean? And secondly, when is that result to be assessed or ordered or abandoned? Sorry, Mr. Crittenden, something I should have asked Mr. Burns. Is that um, what we've just been provided a request for the remedy decision? Um, what happened to that? Was, that? was that under appeal to the EAT, and is it under appeal to us? So the, the remedy in, uh, in this respect, the award of two awards yes. for the two offers, rather than one award to the two offers, the tribunal made and the EAT upheld the fact that because the offers were different in some material respects, then you get a completely a new award for each. So that was appealed to the EAT and not appealed to the EAT, and we're not taking on the appeal. So if you, if, well, uh, despite everything you've said so far, um, the EAT were right, then the uh, claimants are entitled to the amount they were awarded, two, two lots. Yes, the £400,000. Thank you. Right, back to you. Uh, so, yes, we <coughs> set out the, the, the two issues which we ultimately are essentially at the heart of the appeal. What is the prohibited result and when is that to be uh, uh, assessed or, or abandoned? And just by way of a few uh, preliminary introductions, Claimant's perspective, obviously, it's key that um, uh, Section 145B derives its origins um, from uh, Strasbourg jurisprudence, and its foundations are firmly rooted uh, at, um, under uh, Article 11 rights afforded to, in this context, uh, members of the trade union. And the principle, which perhaps hasn't emerged so far in of the proceedings today. The principle of importance it, 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 under Article 11 it, it, it is this, where a union is recognised, a worker has a core right to 
Bonds Club levy through their trade union to represent their interests in collective bargaining negotiation. We say that that is a call <coughs> where a union is recognised. And we'll see in a moment um, the uh, uh, latest jurisprudence from the Grand Chamber in the Mir, the Mir case is that the right to bargain collectively is an inherent element or, or an essential uh, element uh, falling within uh, Article 11. And in, in our submission, the, the whole essence uh, of Section 1 key to understanding is uh, to acknowledge that it is designed to protect those very article that right members have to rely upon their union to represent them in negotiations and uh, to prevent an employer from circumventing or undermining uh, uh, that right they have for their union to effectively by making direct offers. Added to that, and I'll come to, to that point in a moment, it's not just the circumvented collective bargaining bypassing the trade union. It's subjecting those members who wish to rely on their union's negotiating power to detriment or penalty. That was also the mischief In terms, in general terms, the uh, claimant's uh, uh, position is that uh, we don't disagree with the EAT majority's uh, 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 reasoning, and the reasoning um, we respectfully contend is compelling in a number of key areas. If I could just perhaps focus very briefly, just give a headline uh, as to what our position is uh, on the appellant's construction of one four five B. If I can refer it to the, the, the double future argument, not the majority sentence, but the double future argument. Um, so you consider what the position would be in the future, the offer's accepted, and then you take a small jump and then consider what the position would be after the offer. Um, the claimant's position is, is that uh, uh, inevitably ill accords with uh, the claimant's rights uh, under Article And the reason why um, it, it can accord with those Article 11 rights it is um, because of the legislative scheme. It focuses on the offer being made to the uh, worker and the effect of that offer. If on the appellant's uh, double future argument, the importance of the original offer gets minimised or negated. And that initial offer may well be a substantial incursion into the member's Article 11 rights to have their rights uh, bargained uh, by on behalf of their union. And if the appellant is right, not only does the original offer lose its significance, but um, the tribunal's ability to scrutinise why that original offer was made is also on the appellant's case, that doesn't really matter. They've got to look at the position after, in the future after the offer has been accepted. So they're not looking at why the offer was actually made. You're, you're using the phrase the original offer, Mr. Whittington. Do, do you mean the, do you mean the <coughs> offer made directly to the members? The word of apologies, yes. Right. The, the, okay. the offer... The di the the direct direct can we call it the direct the offer? Direct offer. Oh. It's yeah. the, 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 the key point is, if uh, on the appellant's case you don't, one doesn't look at the direct offer, one looks at some indeterminate point in the future. What that means is, is that the uh, tribunal's ability to, to uh, consider the effect of that offer as against the um, claimant's Article 11 rights, have they been undermined, have the collective bargaining process been undermined in any way, is minimised on the appellant's case. And likewise. Um, the legislative scheme focuses on the employer's sole or main purpose in making the offer when it actually does. On the appellant's case, one 
doesn't look at that one simply, asks a different question. What is the employer's um, purpose or intention at some unspecified point in the organisation? So, so that's just a few, by way of a few um, uh, preliminary um, observations. My submissions will address or follow the following uh, 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 sequence. Um, firstly, uh, addressing Wilson Palmer. Uh, secondly, briefly, the enacting history. Thirdly, the construction of 1.5b. And lastly, the um, uh, consequences, we say the adverse consequences, the flow of the appellate's uh, uh, construction arguments are, are, are correct. Um, Lord, in, in relation to Wilson Palmer, um, whilst the, the facts in that case were, were clearly concerned with the employer making uh, direct offers uh, as inducements for workers to forego or surrender on a permanent basis um, their collective uh, bargaining uh, uh, rights they had acquired. The, the principles, if one looks carefully, uh, the spell by the Wilson Palmer uh, decision uh, are, are of necessity of much wider and broader application than the permanent relinquishing cessation. Uh, and there was, as I'll demonstrate in a moment, I can set out the two headline points. The key facets of Article 11 which were engaged um, in Wilson Palmer were, were twofold. Uh, and the first is, is that the legislation, domestic legislation at the time, permitted the employer to make direct offers to workers in circumstances where the union was recognised and those direct offers had the effect of undermining or frustrating each member's right to rely upon their union to care for or to look after their, their interests. And the second facet was the uh, ability of the employer to subject a worker who did not accept or succumb to the temptation of the direct offer to a detriment or penalty. Now that was a key um, facet which featured in that case. And in relation to those two principles, it doesn't matter, we say, whether or not there's a permanent cessation of collective bargaining, um, a narrowing of the topics of collective bargaining, or whether it's a, uh, a, 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 a improper behaviour which has the effect, effect of undermining the trade union in one periodic round of collective bargaining. These principles Spectrum. And, and we can perhaps just turn very briefly to uh, Wilson um, in dividing the board the authority. And I'll try and take this as briefly as I can because you've already uh, got a flavour of, of the, um, the facts and ruling. Um, if one turns to um, paragraph uh, one of the judgment, um, one can see that there were three sets um, um, of applicants, and these proceedings were, were joined. And if one turns to paragraph three, um, the uh, applicants allege that Lord United Kingdom, by allowing the employer to de-recognise trade unions, failed to ensure their rights to protect their interests through trade union membership. To freedom of expression, contrary to Article 11 of the Tenant Convention. And then here is the key, another key aspect. In addition, the individual applicants complain that the United Kingdom law committed discrimination by employers against trade union members, contrary to Article 14 in conjunction with Article 11. So the key feature uh, underpinning each of these uh, 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 three headline uh, applications was not only the offers to relinquish. was that these individual claims, when they refused the employer's direct offer, were subjected to, as referred to as discrimination there, the detrimental financial penalty um, uh, 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 are equally applicable. And we can see this very briefly. Uh, paragraph 9 of the, sets out the facts of uh, uh, Wilson uh, and uh, against the Daily Mail. Um, the offer is at paragraph 10, we don't need to, to go through it, but that's where the, the offer is, the, the union is going to be de-recognised, and one can see halfway down uh, 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 paragraph 10, where the letter 
it's, it's quoted, there's a reference to a 4.5% wage increase if the individual accepted that offer. And paragraph 11, Mr. Uh, Wilson refused the offer. And in the last four lines, in subsequent years, Mr. Wilson's salary increased but was never raised to the same level as that of employees who had accepted the personal contracts. So that was one aspect of which the, 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 the claimants in that case, the applicants in that case, were contending they had been discriminated against. Um, and uh, in paragraph 11, uh, sorry, paragraph um, Thirteen deals with the uh, other applicants, the third and fourth applicants, Mr. Palmer and Mr. Wyatt, who are employed by Associated British Ports. Um, again, we've got the letter that they received at paragraph 14, which I'm not going to read out, but it, it, again, it's agreed to a, a direct contract uh, in exchange for um, a pay rise and also offer of medical insurance individuals and their family. And if one goes to paragraph 15, um, uh, the third and fourth applicants refused to sign a personal contract. Their pay and, uh, and conditions of employment for 1991-1992 were decided on a collective basis following negotiations between the union and the employer. They received an increase of pay and allowances of 8.9% and were not offered the private medical uh, insurance. So again, they were relying upon their trade union and others who have received direct offers receive more, more generous uh, uh, allowances. And the, the same uh, uh, point uh, uh, arose in relation to uh, Dugan and the other seven applicants at paragraph 17. Uh, paragraph 18, they refused to sign personal contracts. As a result, received only a 4% annual pay increase from their basic rate of pay. Employee, those employees holding the same positions as the applicants who accepted personal contracts received a pay increase which was approximately 8 to 9 percent greater than was awarded to the applicants. So, the key point there is that they weren't just complaining about the cessation offers to cease or seize their rights to collective bargaining, but also the And um, if one, to understand the, the uh, it's necessary to consider the, the facts because it informs the, the court's reasoning. But in paragraph 38, the court set out um, the provisions uh, of Article uh, 11. And if one looks at little one in the indented text, um, the, everyone has the right to. Uh, to freedom of peaceful assembly and to freedom of association with others, including the right to form and join tr trade unions uh, for the protection of, it's now changed, not referred to as one's interest, my lady, um, but, but for the protection of one's interest. And that, that is uh, uh, key because the uh, court um, confirmed that uh, protection of one's uh, interest is not a redundant concept. If we look at paragraph 41, um, uh, uh, the court acknowledges here that the court observes at the outset, although the essential object of Article 11 is to protect the individual against arbitrary interference by public authorities uh, with the exercise of the rights protected, there may in addition be positive obligations to secure the effective enjoyment of those rights. And um, uh, in the present case, matters about which the applicants complain principally the employers' deal recognition of unions for collective bargaining purposes and offers of more favorable conditions of employment. So the employees agree not to be represented by the If one turns to paragraph 42, and it's seven lines down, the court, um, just after the, the words in the brackets, the court then acknowledges the words for the protection of one's interests in Article 11, Paragraph 1, uh, are not redundant. And if I can scroll down just to three lines from the bottom of that page, in the same paragraph, a trade union must thus be free to strive for the protection of its members' interests, 
and the individual members have a right in order to protect their interests, uh, that the trade union should be heard. So that's the two facets. The individual has the right their union uh, can represent. Mr. Burns has already um, referred to paragraphs 44 and 45. Um, and I believe paragraph 46 is already referred to the text which um, is tramlined. Furthermore, it's of the essence of the right to join trade union for protection of their interests that employees should be free to instruct or permit the union representation staff to work or to take action in support of their interests on their behalf. If workers are prevented from so doing, their freedom uh, to belong to a trade union for protection of their interests becomes illusory. It's the role of the state to ensure the trading members are not prevented or restrained from using their union to represent them in attempts to regulate their relations uh, with their employer. We see here that um, prevention or restraint or interference <coughs> would include circumstances where an employer circumvents the collective bargaining process and makes a direct offer to the individual member. And uh, the, what can be described as the discrimination Set out in paragraph 47. They, they, the court never reached a conclusion on that, did they? In the organization of discrimination. Yeah, the article 14. No, yes, you will. that is absolutely correct. What the court said is, in view of paragraph 52, in view of our findings under mm. article 11, we don't need the court to go on. It's not necessary for us to, to, to make findings. We say that the court didn't just ignore the issue. Paragraph 47 actually does address it uh, head on. And it's um, eight lines down. Um, the corollary of this is that the United Kingdom law permitted employers to treat less favorably employees who were not prepared to renounce a freedom that was um, an essential feature of union membership. Some Such conduct constituted a disincentive restraint on the use by employees of union membership to protect their interests. And we say that that is a statement of the general principle, regardless, and it, it operates or is engaged, regardless whether there's a permanent cessation of all collective bargaining terms, a narrowing of collective bargaining terms, a scope of collective bargaining terms, or what happens to the one round uh, of collective bargaining. Doesn't that beg the question of what it means to use uh, the, the union membership to protect their interests? Uh, earlier, as both of you have stressed to us, the court was saying a union has the right to be heard. And you've expressed it slightly differently, but I think in substance the same point. The, the members have a right to be represented by their union in the protection of their interests. The fundamental submission Mr. Burns makes against you is that, yes, he accepts there's a right to be heard and a right to be represented, but there's no right to impose your will. So if, you, if, they, if the employer isn't prepared to agree the terms being negotiated, he says the law doesn't prohibit the employer from then going to the individual members to say, well, what do you think? Uh, ultimately, I say ultimately, once the I address it this way: once the employer has recognised the trade union, the employer therefore has to um, respect the members of the union. Their Article Eleven rights in allowing the trade union to represent their interests. That principle. Isn't that the substance of, I mean, we, 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 as everyone I think has agreed, certainly the Employment Tribunal said, this area of law has to be, perhaps more than most areas of law, it has to be interpreted and applied in a way which is 
going to work in the real world of industrial relations. And isn't the reality of the situation that there's the collective bargaining round going on. The recognised union says, we want X. The employer is prepared to go some of the way, but says, no, it's going to be Y. There's an impasse. If the employer then says, well, I, what we, we'd like to offer this to the individual employees. In substance, if you're right, it's going to mean, isn't it, that they're going to fall foul of Section 145B. Lord, um, the answer that goes to the employer's workers, the effect, I'll come to this one, the, what is the effect of the offer is the first question. Mm. What is the employer's purpose is the, is the second element, which must be satisfied. I understand that. Of course I understand that. So, so, so if the employer can demonstrate yes. that they have uh, negotiated, yes. that they've got to the end of the process, yes. um, and the abstract case, if they can uh, demonstrate why it is they want to approach uh, make direct offers at the point in time that they do, yes. then they, uh, as the Employment Appeals Act acknowledge, they will be able to um, um, uh, uh, advance a, a, a proper purpose of facts. Well, what, the, what is the proper purpose? The proper purpose, in any case like this, is to break the impasse and, and uh, solve the dispute. But is that a proper purpose or not? Well, the Lord, um, um, again, dealing with an abstract, if, if the employer has exhausted the collective bargaining process with the trade union, they need to agree process, and the employer um, wants, says, it's unfair that my workforce haven't had a pay rise this year. I want to reward them. Um, I want to ensure that their pay rise at least goes up by the cost of living so they're not taking a real terms pay cut. Well, one would imagine that a tribunal would um, uh, be slow to criticise that employer and say that that employer, when it, when it made the offer at the point in time it did, had to be sold on their claims. But surely, Mr. Britain, I mean, back to my days when I used to do employment law for a living, we, 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 it was more or less something we imbibed with mother's milk, that the, the courts are supposed to stay out of the merits of the, of the reasonableness of the stance taken by each side in collective negotiations. I mean, the, the, um, that was particularly so with um, industrial action aspect of, of um, uh, trade union company relations, but it also, as it seems to me, applies to collective bargaining. How, wh why, is a, uh, why is it a good idea for an employment tribunal to be asked to say, as uh, in, in the terminology of paragraph 62, is it, of the EAT's government, um, for them to decide whether employers are acting reasonably and rationally for proper purposes. Lord, um, I, I, I was going to come to this, but the, the short point is that the legislation asks what is the effect of the direct offer. Hmm. It then goes on to say what was the employer, did, did the employers, what was the, did, did the employer, what was the, sorry, what was, was the, the employer sell the main purpose? Yeah. making the direct offer. Yeah. Section 145D, little four, prescribes three, mm -hmm. three considerations that the tribunal should take into account, which includes um, the manner in which the uh, employer has behaved in, in, these, in relation to A and B. Um, so yes, but, now I quite understand that, and it's a necessary question uh, under this group of sections as to what is the purpose for which the employer is making the offer. Um, what I was saying is that I, I, I'm troubled by the use of the uh, adverbs reasonably and rationally. Who, who are we to say? Who, who, are, who are judges to say whether the employers or the, or the union are acting reasonably and, and rationally? Lord, uh, this is a case where an employer, sorry, this is an area of law where an employer is not going to say, as with uh, uh, trying to develop rules of discrimination, the employer is not going to say, I acted um, with, with the sole main purpose to, to procure the result, prohibited the result. Therefore, in those circumstances, 145D does, it requires.
allows the trial court to have a go at certain considerations. And um, this is a case where uh, Mary thought where it may well be appropriate for the, for the trial court to draw inferences. Now, that's not to say, um, and I make this very clear, it's not to say that where anyone's going to be expecting the trial court to say, look, employer, you should have offered three and a half percent as opposed to two and a half percent. That would be wholly inappropriate. Um, and the trial court, no one would expect the tribunal to engage in, in, in that sort of uh, analysis. But, but it might be said that it's wholly unreasonable in November to seek to connect um, holidays next year with the necessity of sorting out a Christmas bonus in the next couple of weeks. I suppose I don't want to stray too far from, from the actual factual circumstances. Well, that, that's why I gave that example. Well, Lady, in terms of the, um, the, the facts of this case, the collective bargaining negotiations had not um, uh, ceased when the uh, employer made the uh, first offer to the workforce, the first direct offer. Um, um, there was a meeting, a pay negotiations meeting about four days later. They also hadn't uh, complied with the failure to agree process. I hope that you would take it to it. But could, we, could we see it? Yes. Well, yes. Um, and uh, it's in the supplementary uh, bundle. And uh, page 57. Procedural process, there will be no sanctions of any kind of mine, nor change imposed by either party. So it's a state, it's a classic status quo uh, 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 provision. And then there's four stages, I don't want to go through them all but unless you persist. But stage four um, makes reference to a case conciliation. And this this applies to to um, annual or regular pay bargain. Lord, yes, it applies to uh, that's what the parties actually um, pursued after the offers have been made. Applied after the offers have been made. So, so you're, you're, you're saying that um, at a minimum it must be unlawful for the employer to make any direct offer unless all of this one, two, before, including ACAS, has been gone through. Lord, yes, or, or at the very least, it, it is a powerful inference uh, that would be material as to whether what the employer had done, what the employer's sole main purpose was. Sorry, so the main purpose was? Um, uh, in making the offer, the yeah. direct offer to, to the employer. I don't know if my Lord had finished his. I mean, what worries me, speaking of myself, I mean, it, it, with the Employment Appeal Tribunal's reasoning at paragraph 62 is that it appears to stray away from the only question which the legislation actually asks, which is nothing to do with reasonableness of anyone's purpose, but it is simply, as a matter of fact, what was the purpose? And, and if, if, in fact, the purpose, or at least the main purpose, was to achieve the prohibited result, it doesn't matter if you had some benign motive, but ulterior purpose, motive, we've got into all of those sorts of things in discrimination law. And what at least it seems to me one has to focus on, and nothing else, is whether the employer's main purpose was, as a fact, to achieve the prohibited result. Now, if the prohibited result is, as you submit, it is, seems to me in 
the vast majority, if not all cases, of realistic industrial relations. That is going to be the employer's purpose. Of course it is. Because they're going to say, as my Lord said earlier, our purpose was to break the impasse. Well, they're not going to say, they're just going to be, the employer will say, we've gone through the processes we've been required to do, we want to reward our staff, we want to give them a pay rise. And well, I know, but that in substance is, if you're right, that any time that you, you, uh, you've had a collective bargaining process going on, and the employer goes behind, goes over, the EAT used the word, I think, go over the heads of. So the, the employer decides to go over the heads of the representatives. Then the whole point of it is, if you're right, that that is enough to mean that you have, in effect, at least for that bargaining round, you have dispensed with the bargaining process, then... <laughs> They're always going to, they are in substance going to have that as their purpose, albeit they may have some benign ulterior motive. But that's nothing to the point. But also, it, it depends on the point in time they go over the union's head. Right. And that's important for the process. Here, as the tribunal found, um, during, in the midst of the very negotiations which were ongoing with the union, that's when uh, the employer said that he wanted the, uh, the union to be able to represent its members. If at the end of the process, the employer then makes a, a direct, direct offer to the staff, it's not enough that the employer knows that the offer that it's making or communicating to the staff will not be one which we determine by collective agreement with the union. Um, that's incidental and inevitable when the union's got full recognition. What the tribunal will be, tribunal will be focusing upon is why the employer, what, what was the employer's motive Staff. It may well be to reward the staff, it may well be to, to retain them, to ensure that their, their pay keeps pace with, with, with inflation. But, but, uh, as the EAT said, there is an infinite spectrum of, of facts and, and considerations. So you say that if, um, if a direct offer is made before the exhaustion of the four-stage procedure, it must, it say, facto be a breach of 145B? Depending, well, no. It would have a prohibited result in terms of the effect. It would be contingent upon what the employer's sole or main purpose was. But as my lord said, um, it will usually be to achieve the result which was achieved here. We can put aside the, the cases where, such as Wilson and Palmer and Doolan, Employers were trying to de recognize the union. Put, put that more dramatic case to one side. This is a case where there is uh, uh, a dispute in the annual bargaining round. Um, the employer wants to resolve it. Now, uh, it seems to me, uh, I don't understand how that can be. Um, prohibited in some cases, but not in others. Lord, in terms of 145 BR, I'll we'll come to a moment. Mm. Two questions, or two sequential questions. What is the effect of the employer's direct offer? Mm. Does it mean one way of terms will no longer be determined to go mm. The second consideration about subsection 1B is was the employer's sole main purpose to achieve that collective result? The, um, the onus is on the employer to, to establish what its purpose is and mm. to show uh, that although it knew that it was uh, that the offer it was communicating wouldn't be uh, a collective benefit, but an offer of collectively agreed terms that was by and by the last then to be it had uh, another purpose. I'm not saying, um, and I can say, that uh, every time uh, an employer makes an offer uh, during uh, the midst of the collective bargaining process, um, then inevitably liability will um, attach under the Department of Because uh, it may well be the case the employer has an incredibly pressing financial imperative and it hasn't got time to negotiate. Could 
haven't we got difficult, two difficulties with that approach? One, we're back to, as my Honourable Justice Singh was saying, into uh, your indulging in considerations of uh, the negotiations and the reasonableness or otherwise in, in determining whether or what the purpose was. But also what concerns me, if you, if you think about your financial aspect of it, uh, doesn't that then necessitate potentially the employers divulging very sensitive financial information uh, which may have a serious impact, I mean, either in a big firm perhaps on their share price or their local competitors in a more, more local way because they'll have to disclose highly confidential information or may have to in order to establish the purity of their purpose. Lady, in the um, world of employment trials, where I operate, where I operate or perhaps here, um, quite often there is detailed evidence given by employers as to why they need to make redundancies on a particular occasion. Um, and, and employers are, 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 are accustomed to providing um, uh, financial just or adducing evidence as to uh, why, it, why, why they took certain decisions. Now, what, one's not Well, it may be that there's a special subset of um, uh, measures taken in an emergency where the company is heading for the rocks, but that's certainly not what we're concerned with. We're, we're concerned here with. belittling it, but a very common or garden set of facts, at least in those companies where there are still recognised trade unions, that there's, there's disagreement in the course of the annual pay round, and an impasse is reached. And then add to that the conclusions uh, reached by the tribunal that the um, uh, only Of the, of the whole workforce, not, not just of United Nations. It was a union ballot. So it's just the 55? 
It's the 50 fund. Well, it's about it. The, the union then, the union's under no obligations to mm. the, the entire fund. Right. So it's. Three against and one abstention, and that that determines the whole thing in the in the nature of it. Yeah. That is the fabric of yeah. That's relations. Yes, right. Um, but we have the um, uh, uh, letter of the tenth of December at five point five. Yes. Um, then at five point sixteen, we have the general notice. see the last two lines of 119, um, it was said that 77% of the employees had already signed their acceptance, and that included trade union representatives and members. 5.17 was a further pay negotiation meeting, so there's some scores that took place in the midst of the negotiations. Um, and then at 5.19, there's reference to the uh, recognition agreement looked at the procedure to deal with um, cases where collective issues were not resolved. So before the direct offers had been made, but that process had, had been exhausted. Um, then you have the um, offer at 5.23, page 121. Sorry, 5.24, uh, page 121. That's the 29th of January letter. And that was the letter that staff were told that um, it was dismissed. Um, and the tribunal noted that third paragraph is at the bottom. No reference was made to that action as the dismissal being immediately followed by re engagement on the new terms. Then at 5.27, um, page, there's a reference to the general notice of October 2016. Where it was noted the respondent would not be in a position to make any decisions to pay rises or bonuses as the outcome of those tribunal proceedings. Um, and the bonus, the time of pay bonus, was the only, uh, only uh, uh, reason advanced as to why the uh, respondent or the employer acted as it did. And then when one turns to the tribunal's conclusions, they start at page 126. And as to the employer's uh, purpose, is it page 128, was that result, the employer's the result of the sole or main purpose of making the offers? The first paragraph points out the claim is need to establish a prima facie case. Sorry, which Sorry, page 128, uh, halfway down the page is the heading. Yes. I can just paraphrase the first paragraph uh, points out the need for the claimants to establish a prima facie case. Um, and then the third paragraph under that section, respondent's case is their sole and main purpose in relation to the December 2015 offer was to ensure the employees did not lose the Christmas bonus. That was the only reason pleaded for BT3. We cannot discern any other reason from respondent's evidence. Follows that in relation to the second offer made at the time of the recipient's letter, we'd already lost their Christmas bonus. The respondent has not shown any denying the reason. Uh, with regard to the Christmas bonus, it has to be borne in mind that was introduced into the negotiations by the respondent. That uh, is as a bargaining tool. In those circumstances, we consider it somewhat disingenuous for the respondent to say it made an offer to save the relevant employees the consequence of the threat which it had made. Uh, and they go on. Um, we also bear in mind that whilst Mr. Johnson's evidence was consistently that under no circumstances would the parent company allow the Christmas bonus to be paid, other uh, than within the December of the relevant year, we note in general uh, notice introduced for day two of our hearing because of concerns about the outcome of these proceedings, the respondent indicated it might not be in a position to return the pay and bonus, therefore indicating. And then, um, uh, I'll put four, four paragraphs down on page 129. It is, however, significant. 
contemporaneous correspondence shows the making of the first offer with immediate reaction to the rejection of the ballot, mm. the respondent's proposal. We further agree that the respondent's true intentions can be gleaned from its publication by general notices of the percentage of employees who have already signed their acceptances, including trade union representatives and men members. On the fact or is it was plain that Henry McCart found um, bad results disappointing from that perspective, Mr. Johnson said that Mr. Coop, the respondent took a conscious decision to bypass further meaningful negotiations and contact in favour of direct and conditional offer of individual employees who have entered that union. We therefore agree it was exceptionally improbable that the respondent would not attempt to circumvent the collective bargaining process when the offers were made. Well, it's it's speaking for myself. That seems obvious in fact that the employers intended to circumvent the collective bargaining process. Which is the, que the question is whether that's um, uh, uh, prohibited or, or not. And, and on those findings, yes, it would be prohibited. It would be. Cause the, Why? Because the, employer, the employer's sole or main purpose, or predominant purpose, was to um, um, uh, uh, introduce terms by means of a direct offer which are not collectively bargained. Yeah, well, that indeed, that indeed is, is the question we have to decide, but it, I, I, I don't see that the, the, the employment tribunal findings make this fact specific. They, uh, as I read it, they, for whatever reason, it doesn't matter really whether it's reasonably or not, or just because they're exasperated or impatient or whatever, they they circumvent the bargaining process by making a direct offer. Um, if Mr. Burns's construction of section 145B is correct, that doesn't matter. And if yours is correct, it's prohibited. I, 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 um, it, 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 is it more complicated than that? The rules, no, but I, I, will, I will emphasize that these are they're rather, they're rather commonplace facts, surely. Um, <laughs> well, 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 um, I, I, I need to obviously move on to 145B and the yes. construction. Yes, no, let's, let's, let's just finish off with the Wilson Palmer and I'll perhaps address some of the concerns that the Commission of Pension has. Of course, yes. 145B. Um, the, just to finish off Wilson Palmer, the, the key point there is that under Article a member has a right to allow the union to represent their interests. Um, what an employer is not allowed to do in those circumstances is uh, to bypass the trade union and make direct offers. If they do that, then Article 11 is engaged, and um, because the workers' rights to rely upon their trade union Added, uh, and, and that applies whether it's a permanent cessation status or, or a, a narrow cessation status bargaining or one off uh, behaviour during the one off round of, of, of collective bargaining. But added to that in the Wilson uh, Palmer um, was the fact that workers in that situation have been subjected to a detriment or a penalty. They refused the direct offer and they were not entitled to the same. Uh, in, in Wilson and Palmer. Yes. In this case, those uh, similar analogous documents to the discrimination to use the courts label applies here. Those members who refused the first offer on the 10th of December 2015, they never received. Tribunal's findings in fact, um, those who hadn't been accepted by the 18th of December permanently lost the opportunity to have the Christmas bonus. And we see the second letter sent out, the second offer, 29th of January. Um, anyone who hadn't signed that offer, who had signed the acceptance of that offer, uh, um, did not receive. 
that is the um, final true protection of all discrimination which I intend to But is it is it, is it this isn't a section one four six claim and it seems to me it can't be said to be a detriment on, on the grounds of trade union membership. It, it, the, 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 um, everybody who didn't sign up, whether they were members of Unite or not, were, um, uh, lost the Christmas bonus. Lord, the only reason why I was teasing out these aspects, uh, the facets of Article 11, was part of that, because Wills and Parliament is the, the genesis of all 143. And unless one understands the full import of Wills and Parliament and what Article uh, 11 rights are engaged, it's necessary to understand that us to the, the, the right paragraph of your skeleton argument and see how you put it and, and then we'll see what we need from the from IRLR. disputes this collective bargaining he accepts what, what he says is that there's no right to an agreement at the end of it yes I agree there's no Strasbourg decision which says or bribes being made to trade union members to forego union rights. Those were the particular employer behaviours that gave rise to the Wilson Palmer cases. They should be made by the court. So that's yes. squarely Wilson yes. Palmer territory. Um, but it's quite clear that the, uh, Palmer's intended to go well beyond the extreme facts of Wilson Palmer. But one counts eight lines down with the sentence beginning in addition. In addition, so that's as distinct from or separate to the Wilson Palmer scenario, uh, uh, offers should be made unlawful whose main purpose is to induce a group of workers who belong to a recognised trade union to accept that their terms of employment should be determined outside collectively agreed uh, uh, procedures. Uh, the 
result is it would be unlawful for them not to offer and produce and receive products in such a group to have their terms of employment determined outside the framework uh, set by uh, uh, any existing collective bargaining arrangements. We say that's key. It doesn't matter whether or not collective bargaining uh, arrangements uh, cease or are withdrawn or the employer serves notice. Uh, if a direct offer is made, which uh, yields uh, uh, an employee or worker having their terms uh, determined outside that framework, Section 145B is engaged. Um, and there's no requirement uh, uh, in this part of the guidance for there to be a, a permanent cessation or permanent surrendering of, of, of any uh, 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 terms which are negotiated or determined by, by collective Agreement. So we say that properly uh, viewed, paragraph 3.5 of the uh, 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 consultation response is cast in very broad terms. Um, and um, just to emphasise again that, that one can see uh, what the Parliament was, what the government today was uh, seeking to uh, address. It's five lines from the bottom of uh, 3.12. To avoid inflexibility, However, the law should allow employers to make offers where the sole or main purpose of the inducement is unconnected with the aim of undermining or narrowing the collective bargaining arrangements. Uh, in particular, the law should give room uh, for employers and individuals to enter individualised contracts as I the law for the change of the worker. Key uh, phrase to uh, uh, draw out from that passage is uh, the sole aim of undermining or narrowing arrangements. The narrowing of collective bargaining arrangements would be what I've said before, where one term is no longer out of scope. The undermining is something different. The undermining is where the employer goes over the heads of the union, undermines the collective bargaining process. And we say that... But you say it's sufficient <coughs> if a single term <coughs> is um, uh, dealt with by means of a direct offer to the workers. Yes, or on the legislation. Can I um, put to you a point which is troubling me? Maybe that you're going to come to it anyway, which is the the fact that the the remedy is a is a fixed penalty, um, irrespective of the seriousness of the issue at stake. Suppose you had let's say, um, a dispute over payments for back holiday work. And in the summer, the um, union claim in negotiations that back holiday work should only be done, let, let's assume it, 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 it's something people volunteer for, Back holiday work can only, will only be done in future if it's paid at treble normal rates instead of standard rate, which is paid at the moment. Um, and the employers aren't happy with this. They won't agree. There's an impasse. Um, the employers eventually, or the last Monday in August is coming up, fast, they say to hell with it. They offer the workforce double back holiday rates. Um, they come in and do it, or many of them do, and then each of them, I think on your case, is entitled to £3,830 extra because the employers have gone outside the collective agreement. I should have said it's the same as, as in the present case. Can that be right? Lord, I, I will come to it. I'm about to move on to 145B. But well, just, you don't just, just tell me in advance. You yes. can tell me later whether it, why it's right or wrong, but is that right? Yes, yes, subject to the employer showing that the sole or main, establishing that the sole or main purpose was not to achieve the agreement. Okay, fine. Um, turning to section 145. B. Um, and uh, perhaps 
one looks at it divided one. We, by way of instruction, we, we say that uh, references to immediate result and, and future result, uh, whilst they may be convenient shorthand, that they, they don't assist in, in, in this particular instance. They're not found or referred to uh, uh, in the legislation. The legislation, these provisions could apply regardless of whether it's uh, permanent, semi permanent, or one off uh, direct application to one off uh, round of uh, collective bargaining. But looking at 145B, subsection 1, um, acceptance of the offer together with other words, acceptance to which the employer makes to them, would have the prohibited result. Um, in our submission, Subsection A is solely concerned with the effect of the offer if the condition says it is acceptable. What is the effect? Little B focuses upon the employer's sole or main purpose in making the offers. So that's what, what is the employer's motive? It's important that both are uh, uh, considered sealed way, both are separate uh, 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 considerations. But in, in terms of um, focusing upon the effect, first of all, before we even get to the issue of the employer's purpose, the effect on follow through subsection A um, is defined the printed result in subsection 2, is that the worker's terms can be to any of those terms, will not or will no longer be to buy or not. Now, still staying with the effect, if subsection 2 is uh, 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 designed to define what the prohibited result is or the prohibited effect is in A, rather than uh, adopting um, uh, the appellant's, uh, as it were, double future uh, 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 analysis, to perhaps lift, if one looks at um, subsection 2 um, and lift the words that the workers' terms of employment or any of those terms, if one were to lift those up and put them, delete the end, and put them at the end of 1A, the analytical confusion just completely disappears. Because Acceptance of the offer, together with other workers, acceptance of the offers, which the employer also makes to them, um, would have the result that the workers' terms of employment or any of those terms will not or will no longer be determined by current degree and negotiated by our part. And, and it, it's key because subsection 2, the prohibited result is, is quite a big deal, as the notes say. What we say is, is that this is a, in fact, a straightforward question um, uh, in terms of the effect that is uh, the offer is made to the worker 1A asks in a conditional sense what effect would it have if the worker subsequently decided to uh, accept it and appreciate it, it, it's a bit of legislative re-engineering but on the basis that subsection 2 is a definition section one were to find a way to actually um, add it on to 1A so it was a continuous um, uh, uh, sentence that made sense, it is quite clear that there is only one conditional consideration. If the worker accepts uh, 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 the offer at some point in the future, um, uh, will the worker's terms or any of those terms, in the case they will not or will no longer be determined by it's a straightforward question. It's a simple question. It's not one that calls for double for futurity, as it were. But you also submit, Mr. Brett, um, that the focus of the legislation is, first of all, it's at the time of the offer. Yes. Secondly, insofar as it refers to acceptance, then the focus becomes at the time of the acceptance. Not, not, uh, not immediately after the acceptance. It's, it's, at the, it's the very act of acceptance 
will have these consequences, if it will, if the act of acceptance will have the prohibited result on your submission, that's what's been made unlawful. Lord, yes, and I was going, going to come on to that. Forgive me. No, 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 because it's, it's one point raised by uh, uh, Mr. Burns. At what point, I'm still dealing with effect here. I see. At what point is the prohibited result uh, to be considered or evaluated? It's um, paragraph 26, just to turn to it, of Mr. Burns' social self and argument, that you're at the point of acceptance and you look into the future. That's with that. We say that that is um, a, a, temporary, a temporary unsound way in which uh, uh, to approach it for essentially uh, six reasons. The entire legislative scheme is focused on the offer, not what may or may not come to pass months or years down the line. Something determined. And if one looks at 145B subsection 1, the essential bite is not to have an offer made. That's key. The answer which may or may not be accepted. If it is accepted, as Mr. Burns accepts, that it can only be accepted in the future. And 1A asks, or posits the question in a conditional sense, if this offer is accepted, what would its effect be in an anticipatory sense? Um, the legislation focuses on the employer's sole or main purpose when it makes the specific offer. So that's point three. Uh, um, <laughs> now I've lost you. No Number one, one was the legislative scheme is focused on the offer. Uh, what was two? Two is going to be accepted in the future. Yeah. Yes. Three, the legislation focuses on the employer's sole or main purpose in making the offers. And one can see that by looking at little 1, 1B. One the employer's sole or main purpose in making the offers is. So it's limited to the question as to why was the employer made the offer that it did, not what does the employer intend to do in the future. That's a, a, a distinct and different question, which is why called for by the and the fourth point is 145D um, is, is against uh, the employer's construction. If one looks at little four as to the double futurity argument, if one looks at uh, little four of 145D and the various considerations, little a, when the offers were made, looking at what the employer is doing, when those offers were made, it doesn't matter what the employer may or may not do in the future. B, when the offers were made, the employer did not wish to enter into arrangements. C, if the offers were made only. Um, if, if we take the magnifying glass to 145B4A, can, is there any significance in of the blue perfect. When the offers were made, the employer had recently changed or sought to change. I think I read that as had recently changed or had recently sought to change, not was seeking to change. Um, sort of, uh, sorry, had changed is definite, it has. Mm. Uh, sought to change was attempted to change or wanted to change. Mm. Manifests in one of them. But the, if, I, if, Lord, if I could focus on the, 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 um, the next example after the comma, or did not wish to use the arrangements agreed with the union in collective bargaining. And we say that that uh, uh, is clear evidence that there not needed to be a requirement for permanent cessation. The great agreements, the arrangements agreed with the union, may still remain uh, in force that year and in subsequent years, but the employer just simply doesn't uh, 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 comply with it for that particular year. There's no requirement for permanent cessation. Um, 
I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but at some point, and I, and I don't want to take you out of time at all, but at, at some point, can, can I just put this to you and ask for your assistance? Speaking for myself only, I'm beginning to think that it may be a red herring that's been introduced, I think, by the appellant, and with respect, uh, this, this business of permanent cessation. I'm, I'm not sure that actually is what the dispute between the parties about construction really is. Can I suggest what I think the dispute really is about? It's, it's not a temporal question. It's a question of whether there is an attempt being made, as in Wilson, to have negotiation with individuals and, uh, and relinquish or abandon collective bargaining could be, not on a permanent basis, but for this year. That's why I say that the permanent business may be a red herring. The question is, Mr. Burns submits, I think, he may not accept this being put in his mouth, but let me suggest that this might be what he's really arguing, that the mischief being aimed at by this legislation is if, a, if an employer tries to give an inducement to individual employees to abandon the collective bargaining process, albeit only for this year. Whereas what, what I think what you're saying is it doesn't have to be an, a complete abandonment of the collective bargaining process if, in fact, what's going on is that there is a recognised union, they are in negotiation with the employer, terms are being talked about. If the employer goes over the heads of the representatives and during the negotiation process gives an offer of an individual term to individual employees, even though the employer has no desire to abandon collective bargaining, even for this year, you say, I think, that's enough. Yes, that is essentially because if one looks at the effect, what is the effect of the offer? I've already addressed uh, in the court on that. Um, uh, any Will a situation arise where any of those terms will not be determined by collective agreement? There just needs to be one term. Then it goes on to the employer's sole or main purpose um, and subject to the employer advancing the terms as to what is the sole or main purpose. What's the liability must, must, must uh, attach yes. in, in relation to that? Uh, um, Lord, can I just turn to your previous question about? Um, focus a bit on the offers uh, and acceptance rather than what happens after the period of acceptance. Um, yes. If one looks at the um, prohibited result definition 145b2, the result is the workers' terms of any terms will not be determined by collective agreement. We say determined is a definite that something has crystallised. So the terms of the workers' employment have crystallised in a definite sense. It can't be read as Mr Burns suggests that ongoing negotiations may or may not happen in the future in relation to those terms or similar terms. So, so for those reasons, we do part company with the propositions Paragraphs 23 and 26 of the uh, appellate's first part, page 73. So, paragraph 23. Result is that the workers' terms will not will no longer be determined by collective agreement, uh, will not will no longer looks into the future from and after the moment of acceptance. We part company with that. The whole focus is on the offer and the employer's purpose of making the offer. Um, and then condition E, which is called the DAT, for failing to interpret will not will 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 not is indicating something that must be in the future at the time the worker accepts the offer. But we say that, that has a necessary condition of future step. And added to that, the reference to the prohibited 
result of how that the requirement of terms being determined and sort of decided in terms of crystallising, it matters not whether the conflict of power solution with uh, MQMA continue to recognise the union or continue to bargain with the union or intends to do so in some sort of means. The legislation answers that very casual and simple uh, question. They may intend to do so this year. Uh, to take my Lord's earlier example about the bank holiday rate of pay, I think on your submission, you, you accepted that you could have a perfectly intact collective bargaining process even for this year. But as long as the employer goes over the heads of the union representatives in relation to that one term and makes an offer to the individual employees, you say that's within the legislative mischief here. Yes, it is, subject to the agreement. So the, the agreement of result is before A, before yes. A, the effect is, uh, the effect is. is there, subject to the agreement. Of course. But yes. how could the employer's purpose ever be a defence? I, I, uh, it, it, if, if it's sufficient that the main purpose he is trying to achieve is to have that term the workers' terms of employment um, uh, on this occasion at least not determined by the collective agreement. You win, if you're right. But also, yes, but that's why it goes to the, the importance lies in the employer's sole or main purpose. Mm. One could substitute predominant purpose. The employer yeah. may have mixed motives, mixed justification. The employer may say, look, I appreciate it's an incidental consequence. I know that if I uh, offer staff at this rate of pay for bank holiday, it's not going to be negotiated with the union. However, the employer's purpose in doing it is to make sure we have enough volunteers. But, but that will always, it depends how one defines purpose. Of course, the, the employers want to keep the business going. They want to, they want to have the stuff produced on August bank holiday. In, um, they want to. Uh, they want to reach pay settlement because they want a, uh, a contented workforce rather than one in dispute. Uh, how does one? How does one ever tell? And uh, taking the bank holiday example, how could it vary from case to case? The Lord, because it, it, it's, well, it's, it's the, the uh, subjective intention um, uh, attributed to the, the respondent or the decision maker decided to communicate that, that those terms were done on that basis. And as with uh, many areas of law, it's uh, uh, the same test, um, the sole or main purpose features in the trade union section 146, 152, the tribunals are well versed in determining, for instance, examining why it is, what the employer's purpose or aim for so acting has been. And that would be to need evidence as to why they did the tactic they did. Um, that evidence to be tested for trying to reach their, their, their conclusions. And as the EAT were at pains to, 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 uh, to, 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 to emphasize, purpose is not something that can be considered in, in an abstract with, with, without, a, without, without any, any facts to, to consider. It's necessarily facts sensitive. And that requires evidence to be produced by the employer and then the, uh, I suppose the, the, the just to finish up with two points on, on one of my theory, if, if I may, and just to test claimant's position by reference to a, a hypothetical example that's quite common in those new multi-year pay deals, two or three year pay deals, usually with a, an RPI plus percentage formula. Assume that the employer before or even during the negotiations bypasses the trade union, communicates the When one looks at the effect uh, and uh, the paper on the behavior result uh, under 1.5B1A, uh, it is quite clear that pay for those three years will not be determined, strictly decided by the collective bargaining unit. That, that, that is uh, sufficient uh, for the legislation as well. It doesn't 
that's what happens in these four questions about the constitutions of the protected class. Um, and I perhaps return to some things that, that I, I mentioned in my in the opening of observations. The consequence of the appellant's argument, the, the, the uh, double futurity view of what happens after the direct offer has been accepted, um, it doesn't fit in with the legislative scheme which focuses upon receiving the offer, the employer offers the effect of that offer, and the employer's purpose when it actually makes that offer. And on the appellant's case, uh, one would not ask what is the sole or main purpose in making the offer, the direct offer. You'd be asking an altogether different case, what does the uh, employer intend to do in the future? Does, and on the appellant's case, it's sufficient if That is right. Um, it doesn't fit with the legislative scheme because uh, that is designed to uh, try to make clients what is the employer's sole or main purpose in making the offer it has made. It is not asking what is the employer's intentions going forward. So that would, it, it misses uh, or it, it would be the whole point that the uh, statutory scheme. Can, can I just ask you this, Mr. Britain? Suppose you had a, I know it's not this case, but we're testing the point of legal principle. So you have a scenario where the employer is perfectly content to keep in place the structure, including for future years. But, sorry, it, it, is, it is content to keep the structure for future years. So you haven't got the, the problem that Mr. Burns has raised for you to deal with. You're not attacking that, all right? Can I ask you to deal with a slightly different scenario, which is, for this year, the employer says to its employees, we'll give you each £500 if you agree that this year the bargaining will not be done by your union. So there'll be no collective bargaining, but only for this year. On your submission, presumably that's a clear violation of 145B. Subject to the purpose, obviously. Yes, well, well, yeah, I'm only dealing with result. So it's, a, it's clearly the prohibited result. If that's right, then leaving aside, as I say, what I regard myself for the moment as a red herring about what may happen in the future years, why isn't it perfectly possible to give a sensible construction to this section which does not entail the consequence that just because on one term the, the employer has gone over the heads of the union reps in the bank holiday bonus case, for example. Why does it not make sense? You can give this a perfectly sensible construction without accepting that it has the consequence that you win. But, um, because it, the, the construction, um, the construction won't fit the legislative wording. In terms of the effect of purpose, yes. the, on your lordship's example, the worker receives the offer yes. of five hundred pounds on condition that you uh, you are happy for us not to bargain with the union this year. Um, so, with that having prohibited results, yes, the worker's terms of employment, or any of those terms, i.e., the pay, yes. will not be determined by collective agreement negotiated by the whole of the union. That is satisfied. Yeah. Uh, B is the employer's purpose. But, um, and the legislation um, makes express provision that it only need be one term for any term. That, that I understand, and that's a fair response, if I may say so. But suppose you just vary my hypothetical scenario just slightly. So the employer says, not we're going to give you £500 to abandon collective bargaining completely this year, but we're perfectly happy to negotiate with the union in relation to pay, but in relation to Christmas bonus or bank holiday rates of pay or whether it should be 15 minute breaks or 30 minutes. So in relation to some terms, or just one term, they say, we'll give you 500 pounds. 
So, so please agree with us that we are not required to negotiate with your union in relation to that term. Would that be caught on your submission? Yes. Right. Right. Now, if, it, if it's caught, why could it not be the case that that's what Parliament was trying to prohibit? That kind of scenario where you're giving a bribe to union members not to be represented by their union in the negotiation of one kind of term just for this year. But why does it why does it why does it follow that you also have to give it the construction, which you give it, I think, that whenever the union reaches an impasse in its negotiations, the employer uh, is prohibited from then going above the heads of the union and making an individual offer of the same sort, which has been rejected by the union, to its individual members. Well, in relation to the second scenario, yeah. the impasse scenario, I, I do not say it's necessary. All right. In terms of the effect, yes, subsection 14518A, the effect of the writ is, on, is achieved any time. As to B, what was the employer's sole or main purpose? That requires evidence as to why the employer made the offer at all and when it did. And so, in terms of the legislative scheme, 145B1A was not objected by a should will any term be determined that other than by collective agreement. Once you've identified that, then you look to the employer's sole or main purpose. That's how the scheme is intended to work. Um, and uh, if I can just move uh, uh, on very briefly yes. to the uh, consequences of the appellant's arguments in their construction. Yes. The first issue is time. And 145C uh, sets out a, a, a strict three month time limit, beginning with the date when the offer was made, or there's a series of offers with the last offer. Of course, that's the uh, a very strict, uh, reasonable practicability test. And in our submission, where Parliament has introduced rights, they, they must be capable of uh, possessing meaning substance and enable those rights to be accessible uh, to workers and the scheme, parliamentary scheme to be uh, acceptable. On the appellant's construction using the double futurity of that uh, point, um, we say that that would be would render the, the rights or the time limits under 145C unworkable. To adopt the periodic collective bargaining uh, process, assume it's an annualised process of collective bargaining, assume that in year one um, uh, the employee receives a direct offer about overtime rates, Sunday overtime rates. The uh, em employee is not going to know whether in year two overtime rates will be negotiated with the trade union, um, and therefore if they wait to when they know what the eventual offer is going to be, they're going to be uh, appreciably out of time. So that's the first point. The, the, the second point, and the fundamental point, on the appellant's case, they will even be able to be in a position as to whether or uh, to identify whether or not the direct offer they've received is or could be uh, one that uh, achieves the prohibited result. Because they won't know what the employer is going to mean that workers would have to um, bring claims on a wholly speculative basis and they'd be met with the argument that Mr Burns has deployed this employer intends to continue with negotiations and continue negotiations with the union in future years. It, it would be an unworkable scheme. And this was the point that uh, uh, the EAT was seeking to uh, uh, address. And it's page 49, paragraph 54 of the judgment. Thank you. 
four over. This is consistent with the three month time limit in section 145C1. Uh, and then if one scrolls down to D, in uh, those circumstances, it must be possible for a worker to determine what the effect of acceptance would be within the uh, time limit prescribed. The approach we adopt allows uh, that and creates a coherent scheme. On the other hand, absence of express statement as to the effect of acceptance would be offered in collective bargaining. If the effect of acceptance is only to be judged at some future and identified date, such as the next uh, collective bargaining round, the time limits are unworkable and not merely difficult ones. As we can see, uh, on the appellant's construction, the worker would have to be complaint or necessarily knowing the outcome of the next bargaining round, which would be a year away, therefore, without knowing what effect acceptance would have. And referring to Mr. Berman's um, reference to, I think it was a covert direct offer, which uses his parlance, that um, uh, it wasn't clear to the individual recipient as to whether or not uh, that term may or may not be uh, negotiated in the future. It would place workers in, in, a, in an invidious position uh, if they were to wait for any length of time to see whether or not uh, the term would be visited. Uh, and even if they did institute proceedings, they would be met with the uh, argument, well, we intend to negotiate about this in the future. So the right would be meaningless and inaccessible, would be the solution to that. And then finally, in the, in the last few minutes, um, Consequence of the appellant's contention, in our submission, would unquestionably uh, mean that section 145B uh, was uh, incompatible uh, with Article 11. And briefly revisiting Wilson and Palmer, um, what the appellant is effectively saying is that it is permissible to subject trade members to detriment for refusing to accept direct offers. And where they refuse the direct offers, they don't receive the same pay rise that all other members do. And applying the Wilson Palmer uh, uh, analysis, the workers' rights to uh, Union to represent them in the negotiations are undermined. The fact that uh, the workers choose not to accept the direct offer and uh, um, are penalised or subject to discrimination would render 145B incompatible with Article 11. And what the appellant is effectively seeking is um, a temporary or a transient uh, derogation from uh, um, the Article 11 rights of, of, of the claim, not to have undermine their right or frustrate their ability to rely upon their trade union to, to, to act uh, on, on their behalf. And, and, and to take uh, the EAT is somewhat alive to this because the EAT acknowledged in paragraph uh, 55, and we'll return to it, that there's nothing to preclude an employer from tabling successive direct offers at each uh, bargaining round and simply saying the union remains ready. That would reduce the potential action. Uh, do, do, do you say that the EAT was right at paragraph 55? Because even accepting Mr. Burns's submission that the employer would not be abandoning collective bargaining for the future, if this year they have been able successfully to go over the heads of the union reps and approach their members directly with individual offers, Everyone will then know in the future that that's what the employer might do. And so do you say that when the union is in the future trying to represent its members, it does that in the knowledge that if the law is, as Mr. Byrne says it is, that the employer can at any time choose to go over their heads? And, and is that part of your submission? Um, well, yes, sir. Once bit and twice shy is, is, is the response the union would know that, that that's the, uh, yes. the, the time limit for it. Yes, that would be one factor against my 145C argument, the time limit argument. But 
Some well, well maybe so, but, but it might be a powerful factor in favour of your general argument. That, that, that is, in substance, to get to the result that collective bargaining has been undermined because it's not actually collective bargaining. It's collective bargaining, bargaining so long as the employer is content with what's happening. And the moment they reach, at any given year, if they reach the point where they're not happy with what the reps are saying to them, the reps will know these people can go over our heads and approach our members directly. Yes, and um, VAT said in that sort of scenario, um, the employer could do that at its whim. Um, it would reduce the protections that Section 105 leaves Spanish, almost Spanish. It's not all, all, uh, only solely uh, the reducing the one, scope of one four five B and the protections to vanish. It, it also goes against the grain of the article eleven rights of the rules of Parker and the discrimination or the detriment, uh, uh, as commented upon by uh, uh, the Strasbourg Court, those workers who still in the system and therefore relied upon their union to negotiate for them, who did not accept the offers and who suffered some. If there is any ambiguity in the legislation, we say there's not, but there is. Well, well, hold on. There's no question of ambiguity. Section 3 of the Human Rights Act requires us, if possible, to construe all legislation in a way which is compatible with Article 11. But also, sorry, I didn't say that. And so if there's any uncertainty between the rights and submissions. I see. Um, and, and, Lord, in final remarks. Just, any... just, just a minute. Before we leave this point, the employer could do it. Um, again and again, if it wanted to undermine the collective agreement. Surely, uh, it, the collective agreement has a termination clause, as they usually do. The, the company can give six months' notice to terminate the agreement. Um, the, um, the union can't sue for breach of contract. It's got, I mean, it, it, may, it might have industrial relations consequences, but, uh, but it's, got, it's got no legal remedy. If the company just says, we're fed up with this, we're giving six months to terminate, and, and next year we'll negotiate with people individually. That doesn't give rise to um, a, a, a penalty of £3,730 per member or anything else. The Lord, but it doesn't, because the qualifying gateway words of 145B are member of a recognised trade union. Yes. So if the union is not recognised, the, uh, the worker Mr. Britton, don't we also have to bear in mind that whatever construction we give to Section 145B is going to be applicable to all cases in which there is a recognised union? Uh, may, and it may be that in some cases that will f have followed from the statutory recognition obligation. Yes, and then the, is that right? Yes, and if the parties don't actually, um, if the CAC imposes specified that you have not the entire text, then that is contractually binding between the parties. Yes, as Mr. Burns said this morning, what often happens in practice is that once you've had the ballot, which indicates that the, the workers do want a union to be recognised, then employers often choose not to go through the rest of the statutory process in the 1999 Act for statutory recognition. Well, that's a matter of choice for them, but if they chose not to, if they chose to uh, proceed in the future without recognition of a union, then there is legislation which could, in certain circumstances, require them to recognise a union. Yes. Yes. Because the workers would have a settlement, the union would have to make any payments to the CAC, right. perhaps some voluntary process, and then go through the, the balloting process if required. I see. Um, uh, there was just one or two, two points. Um, the specified method order that Mr. Burns referred to, provider three. Um, and particularly, the, it was the indent, it was over the tram line, uh, marked the passage on page two of that. We, we say that that, that isn't uh, uh, engaged because it's not focused about the rights of the employer. The fact that CAC has imposed a method does not affect the rights of individual workers. It's focused on work. For example, does it prevent or limit the rights of injured workers to discuss, negotiate, or agree, agree with their employer in terms of their contract employment? So, in that 
that situation would work is the employer would be responding to an approach by the individual and would be making them a direct offer. It couldn't be said that they received a beneficial offer which had on it to do with purposes of the legislation. And finally, in relation to veto arguments, um, can we can say these are overstated. The employer uh, will know what its sole and main purpose is when it makes the offers. Uh, and uh, as the EAT points out in paragraph 61, I'll read, read it out, that there is an infinite spectrum. In relation to the veto point in paragraph 62 and 64 of the uh, judgment. I just have one moment. Thank you. 
must be, that does not indicate with that willingness you know, to, to meaningful negotiations because they then say it says no more than it says no more in our judgment than simply we do not want to transfer negotiations. It was corrected, but not with the, the so this isn't a this is a case where Costa was just pragmatically trying to push through this one off offer. This wasn't the case that the tribunal found that there was any hostility to effective bargaining laws in the union. And so I say this one isn't an extreme case. This is a case where if the tribunal had actually looked at the offer and looked at the result, then there would have only been one answer, which is the cost of work taking a one off. They were quite happy to continue negotiating with the union, quite non hostile at all, and indeed, as the tribunal found, they carried on negotiating and eventually reached agreement on the plan. So I wouldn't categorise this as being the extreme. Very grateful to both of you. You are deserving judgment. No surprise there. Um, we will um, send out a draft in the usual way for correction of typos or minor factual errors. Hopefully, we will be able to agree an order. And, uh, we, um, I, I think I speak not only for myself in saying what it pleasure it was to have an interesting case so well argued. Thank you very much.